Yes, yes, I'll get, I'll get back to you on that. Bye-bye. <laughs> when is a phone not a phone? Well, if it takes and makes phone calls and if it goes everywhere with you, then it's a phone, as simple as that. I realise this is something of a change of definition for me, um, which is why I wanted to set aside my, my thoughts here in this phone show. You see, take one of the very largest phones that's popular today, the Samsung Galaxy Note 2 here. 5.5 inch screen, great camera, a great speaker, I can get round touch with. And yet if you give it to your wife or girlfriend, and I'm sorry if I'm being sexist here, but they'll say this is just too large to be used as their day-to-day -day phone. Which is where I was coming from when I declared the original Samsung Galaxy Note to be too large. Samsung thankfully uh, dis discovered the design mistake and made the Note 2 thinner and taller, making it much easier to hold in the hand. I've reported previously on the Sony Xperia Z Ultra with a 6.4 inch screen. There's the Asus phone pad with a 7 inch screen. Go and mark out a 7 inch screen on a ruler and then imagine yourself using a phone that large. The term phablet, phone plus tablet, of course, is universally despised, but I'm not sure there's even a need for the word to exist in the first place. Sticking with my definition, if it goes everywhere with you, it's a phone. If it doesn't go with you uh, from room to room, if it doesn't go from you down the pub or down the restaurant, then it's not your primary communications device and it's not a phone. Tablets are exactly the devices we enjoy at work, at home, when commuting. They may even have some voice capabilities via a headset, but you don't take them from room to room, you don't take them necessarily down the pub, you don't take them into the bathroom, what you do, <laughs> you're weird. All of which leaves me surprising myself. Instead of a, a technical or even dimensional definition, I'm left with a simple definition of what makes a phone a phone that works for all of us. You may prefer a phone-sized phone, as it were. This is the Nokia N8 from 2010, one of my classic favourites. There's the Motorola Raze I Stroke M from last year, which I liked. There's this, the Galaxy Note 2. Terrific phone, though large. And this, yes, there are things like the Z Ultra coming up. But if it goes everywhere with you, repeat everywhere, then it is a phone. And as a result, I'll cover it here on The Phone Show. Regular phone show chat podcast listeners, what do you mean you don't listen? Here's the URL. <laughs> well, know that I periodically go back to this, the Nokia Lumia 920 running Windows Phone 8. I check out the latest OS and app updates and I try living with it as my daily phone again. It's not quite there yet, though needing the fabled GDR2 update coming in the next month, I'm told. In addition, the LED equipped camera just couldn't quite pull off the indoor people shots that I take every week. But watch this. Everything I did like about the Lumia 920, including the wireless charging and great speaker, plus Xenon flash for the camera and a stunning AMOLED screen and LTE data. This is the Nokia Lumia 928. And I'm teasing you a bit because this is a Verizon exclusive in the USA, even though it actually runs quite happily on UK networks here in the UK. You'll just not actually be able to buy one. In which case, I'll keep it quite brief. The design is similar to the Lumia 920, but boxier with squared off edges and is less droppable as a result. Most things are in the same place apart from the micro USB port, which is now on the top, and the speaker grill, which is on the back here, and lets sound out better via direct holes rather than forcing it to bounce off internal baffles. The same great speaker case. Well, maybe slightly tinnier than the 920, but that just might be my choice of Muse, the demo music. <laughs> the core specifications are much the same. Dual core 1.5 gig processor, a 2000 milliamp hour battery, though lithium polymer, not lithium ion, interestingly, and sealed, yes. Plus the same also sealed 32 gigabytes of internal flash memory, which should be enough for most people. The screen's AMOLED rather than LCD, but with the same clear black display polarizers. In practice, it's it's more colourful indoors, but slightly more washed out in the sun, so on as even. But the biggest difference is the use for proper zen and flash for the camera, which combined with the full optical image stabilisation should make the Lumia 928 perfect for indoors and evening photography, in theory. In practice, there's no mechanical shutter here and the sensor is no larger than that in an iPhone or Galaxy device, plus the image processor and the OIS is all optimised for long shutter times in low light. As a result, there's something of a conflict and ambition here. Xenon helps, but it doesn't have the same jaw-dropping effect as when used on the Nokia N8 or 808, for example. And as I say, you're unlikely to be able to buy the 928 anyway, so this might be your one and only glimpse of it. Would I take the 928 over the 920? 
absolutely. Aside from availability, there are no downsides here in a straight comparison. But Xenon Flash on Windows Phone, surely it can be done better. Absolutely, which is where Nokia's big launch in New York in a couple of days' time fits in. That will be the device to take on the mighty 808 PureView once and for all. Watch this space. In the last phone show, I pitched two smartphones with OIS against each other, showing how the concept was immensely valuable to smartphones of the future, yet also how Nokia's three-axis approach was much more effective than HTC's two-axis implementation. I've had emails, though, asking how much worse traditional software-only stabilisation techniques are, or indeed would have been. In other words, the HTC One's footage wasn't as good as the Lumia 920's, but how much better was it than video from a top phone without OIS? I have to say that there's not that much in it for general video, maybe slightly less jerkiness in the ones capture on the left. You can see the difference more clearly with the simple walking test as here, with dramatically less jarring on the OIS equipped device. So overcast conditions again, again looking at OIS this time, one with software stabilisation. Can you notice the difference? Is OIS here on the HTC One worth the trouble? You tell me. If I had to score video capture smoothness overall, I'd put the full three-axis optical assembly OIS on the likes of the Nokia Lumia 920 at 95%, the partial OIS on the One at 75%, accelerometer-based stabilisation as on the iPhone 4 and 5 at 70%, and pure software stabilisation at 60%. And now you know, and I promise not to bring the subject up again for a while.